Howdy. This is the final segment where we're talking about planar defects. Um, and in this segment, we're going to talk about a bunch of um, special uh, planar defects. Um, and they're special in a lot of cases just because they're very low energy. Um, but that also means that in, in a lot of cases, they're very frequent uh, to occur. Um, and so these are some very important uh, planar defects that I, I hope you will become aware of. Um, and we're going to first start uh, by talking about twin grain boundaries. Um, now, the picture I show, this is not a twin grain boundary. This is an example of a, of a stacking fault. Um, remember, a stacking fault, we have a missing plane, but it's pretty close to a twin grain boundary because in a twin grain boundary, you know, we have one um, sort of continuous perfect lattice structure, um, and then I could have something like a reflection plane, uh, and the uh, the Twin, the lattice structure is reflected across that. So again, there's a there's a defect here because I don't continue this A B C A B C sequence. Um, I've all of a sudden reversed the order. So now I'm going C B A C B A. So this is an example of a twin that's called a reflection twin. Um, we also have things that are rotation twins, um, and they are again one side of the of the a twin boundary is related to the other by an axis of rotation. Um, so the thing that makes twin ground uh, twin grain boundaries special is that uh, bond lengths uh, tend to be or, or they are conserved on both sides uh, of the twin boundary, um, and that means they have a very uh, low energy associated with them. Um, so this is something that's not a crystal lattice. You know, this is an example of. Um, maybe a monoclinic crystal. Um, and again, there's an interface here. Uh, and I have uh, unit cells on the other side uh, that look exactly the same here, but look very carefully along this grain boundary. There, is, there are no extra atoms squeezed in. None of these bonds are distorted at all. Um, the only thing that happens is that my bond angle um, is uh, sort of offset from what it would ideally be. Um, so twin grain boundaries, again, because they have very little distortion of the grain boundary, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, very little distortion of the interatomic distances, um, tend to have very low energies. Now, uh, in general, there are a couple different kinds of uh, twin uh, boundaries um, in terms of when and how they occur. So you can have something that is called a growth twin, um, and this occurs during a solidification process. Um, uh, or during a solid state uh, transformation um, where a defect sort of spontaneously uh, starts and it kind of continues. And these can lead to these um, sort of interpenetrating crystals like we see uh, in these two cases. Alternatively, we could have a deformation twin. And a, a deformation twin occurs when you uh, are applying some kind of a mechanical load. Um, and so as an example, um, if we look at this crystal lattice here and we say this thing is in tension, um, one of two different things could happen. We could either have slip along some particular lattice planes, that's what's shown to the left, or I could uh, accommodate this tension by having a, a formation of a twin. And so again, in a twin, what has happened, uh, this is another example of a reflection twin, so I can see that the top part this way um, is the same as the bottom part uh, that's reflected across the grain boundary. Um, because this uh, lattice has uh, different unit cell lengths in, in one direction from another, um, then creating a, a pair of twin boundaries uh, reorients the crystallographic lattice between those twin boundaries um, and causes, uh, causes extension of the uh, single crystal. And so that could um, again, accommodate this tension uh, that's being applied. Um, and as additional tension is applied, well, this grain boundary can just sort of continue to move downwards, and this twin boundary can continue to move upwards, and that will continue to elongate uh, the, the crystal. So deformation twins are things that happen in response to a mechanical load. Um, so in addition to twins, um, we have a sort of special orientation uh, rotation angles that can happen. Um, and these are described using something called coincident site lattice theory or near coincident site lattice theory. So this is CSL for short. 
Um, and so what we're going to picture for here is picture an interface um, between, uh, so uh, it's going to be a homophase interface between um, two different grains of a cubic lattice. And so we're sort of looking down on it. And I'm going to start off with those, uh, those grains sitting directly on top of each other. Um, and let's say this is a twist grain boundary. And so I'm, I'm, I'm starting to rotate one of those with respect to the other. If I rotate at just the right angle, one of those atoms from the lattice above is sitting on top of one of those atoms from the lattice below. Um, and when that happens, you know, basically some of these atoms are coincident with the position of the atoms on the lattice below. And that's where this word coincident site lattice theory comes from. So let's back up and show this again. So again, this is uh, two grains of the same crystal that are sitting one on top of each other. We're looking down at this uh, grain boundary. So this is an example of a twist grain boundary. And what I'm doing is I'm starting to twist one. So twist that red one with respect to the blue. And keep your eye on uh, this atom up here, right? So it starts to get displaced from its initial position. And at some point, it's now going to sit on top of a different blue atom. Um, and at this point, again, this is a special orientation relationship because there is some agreement between the lattice above and the lattice below. Um, and we use coincident site lattice theory to describe this uh, relationship. Uh, and we use the sigma n uh, notation where 1 over n is the number of lattice sites that overlap. Um, and so to figure out what that is, let's count how many red lattice sites there are in this square. And so remember, the red on the corner only counts as one. So all these four corners add up to just one. Uh, and then I have two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. So there's a total of thirteen lattice sites, and out of those, one of them is overlapping between the red and the blue lattice. And so this is what I would call a sigma 13 uh, CSL relationship. And that basically means that one out of 13 of those lattice sites are overlapping between the red and the blue lattices. Um, and I see sigma 13 popped up, so we must have done it right. Um, so in order to uh, you know calculate what sigma relationship this is, you, you basically you have to be able to draw both the red and the green, or I mean, in this case, they're red and green, but um, both of the lattices on top of each other. Um, and so this is a case where, again, I've, I've, I've tilted one uh, with respect to the other, um, but I'm looking down at their interface. Um, and in this region, uh, I see there's some overlap between red and green. So the blue dots have both red and green. Uh, and then uh, in the other cases, red is not aligned on green. So again, you just count one of the lattices. So let's pick red. Um, that blue dot, remember, has both red and green on it. So all of the corners add up to one. Uh, and then I see another red here and here and here and here. So one fifth of those lattice sites line up. So this should be a sigma five CSL boundary. Um, and so there are a bunch of kind of common ones that we see. Um, I, I showed this picture before when we were looking at low angle grain boundaries, but again, um, this is the, uh, the energy of that interface as a function of this misorientation angle. Um, and I think these are tilt grain boundaries. Um, and so at certain special relationships, that interfacial energy drops dramatically. Um, and that's because they just have really good alignment. Um, they, they have this special orientation relationship. So there's, you know, a, a smaller amount of deformation at that interface. So the overall interfacial energy is less. Um, and they coincide with these special sigma grain boundaries. So this is a sigma 3 and this is a sigma 11 uh, grain boundary. So that's uh, coincident site lattice theory. Um, and now we're going to talk a little bit about uh, grain boundaries between two different materials. So these are heterophase uh, boundaries. Um, and again, we can describe these as being coherent or incoherent. Um, and so coherent, again, basically just means that the lattice is continuous across that interface. Um, and so if I were to draw some lattice parameters up here, this is in a, uh, a surrounding phase. Let's call this phase alpha, maybe. And this blue region is a different phase. I'm going to call this beta. Um, 
the the um, lattice parameters appear to be uh, aligned in the same orientation, and so that's what makes this uh, this interface here a coherent grain boundary. Um, however, we have to acknowledge that lattice parameters are never exactly the same. So this crystal wants to be, you know, wants to have a different um, size of a unit cell, um, and so in general, it's kind of being pulled or compressed by the surrounding lattice. And if it gets too big, we need to start accommodating uh, those um, uh, differences between the lattice parameters by different kinds of defects like dislocations. Um, so this is still a coherent grain boundary because in general, um, the orientations are the same across the interface. Um, but again, this is a case where the lattice parameter, particularly in this direction, is much larger than the lattice parameter in this direction. And so I'd need to accommodate that by dislocations at that grain boundary interface. The key takeaway here, though, is that coherent grain boundaries basically um, have a relationship where the lattice uh, orientation is continuous across that grain boundary. Um, and and uh, as a special case, um, if, if that lattice uh, direction is continuous and the lattice parameters are very, very close, we can essentially grow what looks like a single crystal of one type on top of a single crystal of another type. And in fact, we can actually have alternating layers where we have maybe uh, three different single crystals, but they're all sort of grown on top of each other. And when we, have, when we have that kind of relationship, we call that epitaxy. So heteroepitaxy means, you know, I'm growing a, a layer of something that's different from the underlying layer. Um, homoepitaxy would be if I was growing, let's say, silicon on top of silicon. Um, this is very important, particularly for the growth of semiconductors. Um, things like uh, gallium arsenide is grown on top of silicon. Things like silicon carbide is... Uh, um, uh, used as a substrate to grow gallium nitride, but in all of these cases, you know, we're using one substrate that's usually really easy to make in a bulk form, and then we're growing very perfect single crystal layers on top of that, where usually the that that epitaxial layer is the one that we care about. Um, the other reason uh, why coherent precipitates are pretty important uh, relates back to strengthening of a material, um, and if the, uh, if the grain boundary is uh, coherent, um, then there tends to be some strain in the host matrix phase. Um, and so you see here, you know, this, uh, this precipitate, let's call it beta, is being surrounded by a different phase, alpha. Um, and because they're, they have a coherent lattice relationship, but, but they, the lattice parameters are somewhat different, the growth of beta is creating some strain on that surrounding alpha. And you wouldn't necessarily see that if you had an incoherent grain boundary, like I'm showing to the left. Um, and so what that means is, again, the reason that we care about these precipitates is they limit motion of a dislocation through the lattice. Well, now that I have this strained host lattice, that, um, that uh, you know, that the... Um, the fact that we're limiting dislocation motion it extends out beyond just the precipitate itself. So these tend to be somewhat more effective in terms of strengthening a material. Um, uh, and in, finally, an incoherent grain boundary is, again, a case where I have, um, you know, a, a precipitate phase growing within a host or parent phase, and there's just no special relationship um, across that uh, grain boundary uh, between one and the other phases. So let's think about um, overall trying to rank these in terms of which have the highest interfacial energies and which have the lowest interfacial energies. So the lowest interfacial energies are going to tend to occur where the, um, the interface is the most continuous and there's the least distortion of, of bonds and the lowest number of dislocations or other defects of that interface. Uh, and so that should be this coherent um, grain boundary that has a pretty close la degree of lattice match match. So this would be the lowest energy case. Um, on the other end, the highest energy tends to occur when you have um, just no real um, uh, relationship between uh, one phase and another surrounding phase. Um, and uh, this tends to be the highest energy because, you know, if I had a case like this one, um, you know, there, there's, there's 
it, there's a greater energetic cost uh, than the previous coherent grain boundary because I have additional dislocations here. Um, but you can always think about it as the system's going to adopt the, um, the lowest overall energy. And something like this can always form an incoherent grain boundary if it, if it wanted to. Um, but the reason it forms this coherent but stretched grain boundary is because that's a lower energy situation. Um, so uh, if I complete out this ranking, the, the picture on the, the left, uh, the incoherent grain boundary is generally going to have the highest energy. Uh, the coherent grain boundary that has, you know, pretty good lattice match is going to be the lowest. And a coherent grain boundary that has some extent of deformation is going to be higher energy as well.